Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, John Russell and I have a report on the latest actions following the weekend's protests in China over the country's severe COVID-19 restrictions. Later, Dan Novak presents this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first. Chinese universities sent students home Tuesday, and police guarded major cities to prevent more protests over China's severe COVID-19 restrictions. The demonstrations started last Friday after at least ten people died in a building fire in the far western city of Urumqi. Reports of the fire led to angry questions online about whether firefighters or victims trying to escape were blocked by anti-virus measures. Rare protests took place over the weekend in at least eight mainland cities and in Hong Kong. Some protesters could even be heard calling for Chinese President Xi Jinping to step down. The Associated Press reported that police broke up the protests and arrested some people over the weekend. On Tuesday, officials at Beijing's Tsinghua University and other schools in the capital announced they were protecting students from COVID-19 by sending them home. The universities said classes and final exams would be held online. Officials at universities in the southern area of Guangdong made similar announcements. In Shanghai, police stopped people and checked their phones Monday night. A witness told the AP that police were possibly looking for apps banned in China. As well as images of protests, with police out in force, there were no reports of protests Tuesday in Beijing, Shanghai, or other mainland cities where crowds gathered days earlier. China established its zero COVID policy at the beginning of the pandemic. The policy was similar to measures many other countries put in place. To try to stop the spread of the virus, many countries have since lifted their antivirus restrictions, but China has continued to enforce its zero COVID policy. Millions of Chinese have not been permitted to leave their homes for months at a time. Inside China, individuals need to show their personal green code to prove they are free of COVID. When entering public places, or when using public transportation, if there is an outbreak in an area, local officials may require individuals to be tested regularly to keep their green code. In Beijing, for example, people are required to have a COVID test at least every forty-eight hours at a government-approved center. Along with tests and isolation, Chinese officials have locked down parts of cities or whole cities to stop the spread of the virus. A whole building could be locked down if a single person who lives there is found to have COVID, and people living there are not permitted to leave for at least five days. Food and other needed supplies can be ordered for delivery. Currently, the central area of Chongqing is in lockdown. So is part of Guangzhou. 
China's policy has succeeded in keeping its death count much lower than many Western nations. Chinese officials said the country has only had 5,233 COVID deaths. Most of the deaths were recorded in the early days of the pandemic, in 2020. Julian Tang is a virus expert at Britain's University of Leicester. He said China's attempt to stop every single case of COVID is simply impossible. He suggested that China should do what most of the rest of the world has done. And learn to live with the virus. The only thing to do is to accept that there is going to be a certain level of disease, Tang said. Ali Mokdad teaches health sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. He said China's strict policy saved lives, but cannot be continued. They cannot lock the country forever," he said. China's zero COVID policy means that its population has very little exposure to the virus. China has developed its own vaccines, but they appear to be less effective than the mRNA vaccines widely used in other parts of the world. Dr. Paul Hunter is a professor of medicine. At Britain's University of East Anglia, he said measures like lockdowns and face coverings were mostly meant to delay as many infections as possible until vaccines were available. Unfortunately, the vaccines in China were not very good, he said. The health analytics group Airfinity estimated that up to about two million people in China. Could be at risk of death if the country were to lift its zero COVID policy. The estimate is based on China's low vaccination rates and the lack of natural immunity among its population. Dr. Bharat Pankanya is an infectious diseases expert at the University of Exeter. Pankanya said Chinese leaders need to find a way out. The Chinese population is clearly fed up with lockdown after lockdown, and the quickest way out is to immunize as fast as possible," he said. Pankanya said China should import mRNA vaccines made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. He said, "The scientific answer is very clear." I'm John Russell, and I'm Ashley Thompson. School systems across the United States have struggled to find workers to deal with students' mental health needs. Mental health problems among students have worsened since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Chalkbeat found that among 18 of the country's largest school districts, 12 started the school year this autumn with fewer counselors or psychologists than they had in the fall of 2019. As a result, many school mental health professionals must work with a high number of cases that go beyond recommended limits, experts say. Many students are having to wait for urgently needed help. Some of the extra need for support has been taken by social workers. The number of social workers has grown by nearly 50 percent since before the pandemic, national data shows. But social workers have different training from other mental health professionals, and have other responsibilities too. School districts included in the research serve a combined three million students. They started the year. With nearly 1,000 unfilled mental health positions, the chalkbeat data is based on school staffing data received through open records requests. 
the 31 largest districts in the U.S., were questioned, but some did not measure or provide data. School systems around the U.S. received money from the federal government to deal with effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some districts used the money to add mental health workers, but others did not. They worried about paying them once the aid money ends. Districts have limited time to spend the nearly $190 billion of recovery money. Many schools that have wanted to hire more mental health workers simply cannot find them. School psychologist positions have been especially hard to fill. With their training, school psychologists provide one-on-one counseling and help students who are at risk of suicide. In Maryland, there is a large shortage of psychologists at Montgomery County Public Schools. The district has kept the psychology department centered on crisis prevention and providing legally required services like special education assessments, said Christina Connolly Chester. She is the district's director of psychological services. That has meant they cannot keep up with other, less urgent counseling services. The district sought to hire workers to help with students who have anxiety or depression or struggle with conflict. But there are still 30 open psychologist positions, a district official said this month. Even before the pandemic, some schools struggled to find psychologists. New psychologists have not been entering the field quickly enough. In the chalkbeat analysis, Half of the 18 large districts budgeted for fewer counselor or psychologist positions this school year than they did in the fall of 2019. For all the talk about mental health, the actual money they're spending on it is not that high, said Phyllis Jordan. She is with Future Ed at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. The group measures school spending. School districts only planned to spend about 2% of the largest round of federal COVID aid on mental health hiring, the group found. There has been an increase, however, in social workers. The Chalkbeat analysis found that the number of school social workers was up 48% this fall compared with before the pandemic. The number of school counselors was up 12%, and the number of school psychologists increased just 4%. In Houston, Texas, hiring increases meant nearly every school started this fall with a counselor or social worker. Newly hired social worker Natalie Rincon is able to meet one-on-one with students who are in crisis and teach other students ways to ease anxiety. Still, the workers are not able to meet all the need at Rincon School. She often has to help the students with urgent issues, leaving less time to check in on others. I want to be able to meet with a kindergartner just to talk about how they're feeling, Rincon said. Those are the kinds of things that I think slip through the cracks. I'm Dan Novak. You just heard this week's education report with Dan Novak. Dan is here now to talk more about his story. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Ashley. Glad to be back. There was a phrase at the very end of the report I was hoping you could explain. Slip through the cracks. What does that mean? It's a very useful idiom. Cracks are lines along the surface of something, where something is split, but has not completely broken. Sidewalks and walls get a lot of cracks, for example, and water or something else could get through them. So the idiom, slip through the cracks, refers to something that is going unnoticed or ignored. The thing that is ignored is often unintentional or not on purpose. Who is slipping through the cracks when it comes to student mental health? As I explained in the story, there is a shortage of psychologists and counselors in many schools across the country. 
but there isn't a shortage of students with mental health problems. So schools are being forced to only help the students with the most urgent and serious issues, but they're less able to help other students with less serious problems. Natalie Rincon, a social worker at a school in Texas, says those students are slipping through the cracks. That is an unfortunate situation. Thanks for helping explain that phrase, Dan. You're welcome. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. As we said last week, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania won the presidential election of 1856. He defeated John Fremont, the candidate of the newly created Republican Party, which opposed slavery. Buchanan, a Democrat, had often supported the South in the dispute over slavery. Most of the new president's closest friends were Southerners. He wrote that the North was too aggressive toward the South and should stop interfering in the slave states. Buchanan said the South had good reason to leave the Union if abolitionists continued their attacks against slavery. Jack Moyles and Stan Busby tell more about James Buchanan, and they discuss his influence in the Supreme Court ruling in the case of a slave from Missouri named Dred Scott. As the new president, Buchanan believed he could solve the slave question by keeping the abolitionists quiet. Success would mean the end of the anti-slavery Republican Party. In choosing his cabinet, Buchanan wanted men who shared the same ideas and interests. President Pierce had tried to unite the different groups in the party by giving each a representative in his cabinet. This had not worked. It had driven the different party groups farther apart. Buchanan had served in President Polk's cabinet. He remembered how well its members worked together. He said it was the unity of this cabinet that made Polk's administration so successful. Buchanan gave the job of Secretary of State to Lewis Cass of Michigan. Cass was 75 years old. His mind had lost its sharpness. This did not worry Buchanan because he had planned to be his own foreign minister. The job of Treasury Secretary went to Howell Cobb, a Southern moderate from Georgia. Southerners also were named as Secretary of War, Interior Secretary, and Postmaster General. Isaac Tausey of Connecticut was given the job of Navy Secretary. Tausey was a Northerner, but he supported many policies of the South. Another northerner, Jeremiah Black of Pennsylvania, became attorney general. In forming his cabinet, Buchanan did not ask for advice from Senator Douglas of Illinois. Douglas was the party's leader in the Senate and the most powerful Democrat in the Northwest. Douglas believed that the Northwest should have two representatives in the cabinet. He said Cass could be one of them. But Douglas wanted one of his own supporters to be the other. Buchanan refused what Douglas wanted, and he gave the administration support to a political enemy of Douglas. <laughs> ¶¶ 
James Buchanan was sworn in as president on March 4, 1857. In his inaugural speech, the new president denounced the long dispute over slavery. He said he hoped it would end soon. Buchanan said the dispute could be settled easily by doing two things. By ending interference with slavery in states where it was legal, and by letting the people of a territory decide if they wanted slavery. Buchanan said he expected the Supreme Court to rule soon on the right of the people of a territory to decide this. He said he was sure that all good citizens, north and south, would accept the High Court's ruling. At the time he said this, Buchanan already knew what the court's decision would be. He had even used his influence to help one member of the court to decide. The decision was made in the case of Dred Scott, a Negro slave. Scott was sold in Missouri to an army doctor who took him to Illinois and then went into the Wisconsin Territory. Scott lived in these two places for almost four years before he was returned to Missouri. Scott asked a court in Missouri to give him his freedom. He claimed that living in Illinois and Wisconsin, where slavery was illegal, had made him a free man. The court agreed with Scott and gave him his freedom. But the decision was appealed, and the Supreme Court of Missouri ruled against him. Scott then took his case to a federal court. Finally, he asked the United States Supreme Court to decide if he was a slave or a free man. The Supreme Court took up the case in December 1856. The judges studied it carefully because it raised serious constitutional questions. Scott claimed he was free because he had lived in free territory. It was free because Congress, in the Missouri Compromise of 1820, made slavery illegal in that area. Scott's owner raised the question, did Congress have the constitutional power to close a territory to slavery? Was the Missouri Compromise legal? At first, most of the nine Supreme Court judges had planned to give a decision without answering this question. They did not want to involve the court in this bitter dispute. The majority decided that a Negro was not a citizen. Therefore, they said, Dred Scott had no right to ask the court to hear his case. In this way, the case could be settled without deciding on the power of Congress to act on slavery in the territories. But two of the nine Supreme Court judges opposed this ruling. Both were from the North, they had said they would write a minority decision. They said their decision would include a statement that Congress did have power over slavery in the territories. Since two members of the court had planned to offer views on this question, the other seven decided the majority also should do so. Of the seven, five were from the South. They did not believe Congress had any power over territorial slavery. The remaining two judges, both from the North, did not want to make what they felt would be a political decision. One Southern member of the Supreme Court was James Catron, a good friend of James Buchanan. Buchanan had written to him, asking when the court would act on the Dred Scott case. 
Catron had answered that the court would rule soon. Then he asked for Buchanan's help in getting one of the northern members of the court to vote with the five from the south. He told the president that the country would more easily accept the court's ruling if one of the northern judges gave his support. Catron proposed that Buchanan write to Justice Robert Greer of Pennsylvania. So Buchanan wrote to Greer. He told him that a strong decision in the Dred Scott case might do much to bring peace to the country. Greer agreed. He said he would vote with the five Southerners. They would rule that the Constitution did not give Congress power over slavery in the territories. All this had happened in the few weeks before Buchanan became president. The Supreme Court finally announced its decision, just two days after Buchanan moved into the White House. Chief Justice Roger Tawney read the decision in the small courtroom in the Capitol building. The room was crowded with congressmen, senators, government officials, and newspapermen. Chief Justice Tawney began reading the decision at 11 o'clock. He read for more than two and a half hours. He said the High Court rejected Scott's claim of freedom for three reasons. First, Scott was not a citizen. Tawney said the Constitution gave the right of citizenship only to members of the white race. Because he was not a citizen, he had no right to ask the court to hear his case. Secondly, Tawney said Scott was ruled by the laws of Missouri, the state in which he lived. Missouri laws did not give freedom to slaves who lived temporarily in free territory. Therefore, said Tawney, Scott was still a slave. Then the Chief Justice took up the question of the free territory in which Scott had lived. It had become free territory under the Missouri Compromise. This was the law that Congress passed in 1820. This law kept slavery out of the northern part of the territory, which the United States bought from France. Justice Tawney said Congress did not have the constitutional power to pass such a law. He said when new territory was won, it belonged to all citizens. He said Congress had the right to govern such territory until it became a state. But, he said, Congress did not have power to close new territory to any American citizen. He said the citizen from Georgia had as much right to settle in this territory with his slaves as a citizen of Maine with his horse. Tawney said there was no word in the Constitution that gave Congress greater power over slave property than over any other kind of property. The only such power Congress held was the power to guard and protect the rights of the property owner. To close territory to slaves, Tawney said, violated the constitutional rights of slaveholding citizens. Therefore, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Congress did not have power to act on slavery in the territories. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson.